my astrology channel. My name is Martine. If you are new here, I do videos on Vedic astrology. I mean astrology mainly from the Vedic perspective, but I also use some tropical insights and um, I also do videos on both synastry or relationship astrology as well as natal astrology. Um, and uh, if you like this video and you would like to hear more content from me, please subscribe, um, hit the like button and the notifications bell to see when I will post a new video. And uh, also if you're interested in a personal consultation on various topics, uh, you can write me an email at the email address that I will leave in the video description. And thank you and let me get into today's topic. So. Today's topic, after much consideration, I wanted to do something to do something about Jupiter. Um, as some of you may know from other videos that I posted or just from other astrology sources, Jupiter is the husband significator in a woman's chart, and Mars is the boyfriend significator in the woman's chart, and. The difference is that Jupiter is basically what a woman will expect in a long-term partner, whereas Mars is the kind of man that she will find, let's say, physically attractive or exciting and inter interesting with regards to a short-term fling. And this is because Mars is the warrior archetype and therefore will be kind of brash, impatient, and more preoccupied with himself, whereas the Jupiter archetype is, you know, wisdom, full of wisdom, and um, kind of a, it's also called the guru planet, for good reason, um, because it signifies, you know, mentorship, it signifies teaching, it signifies higher spiritual spiritual learning, so women want a Jupiter in a husband because Jupiter is going to be a good father and a good long-term spiritual partner who is going to help them and assist them along the way in their lifetimes. Um, so this is kind of the introduction with regards to what Jupiter means in general. Um, Aside from that, right, um, I will mention that I have uh, taken some information from um, Ernst Wilhelm. He is another astrologer on YouTube, um, but he does interpretations from the tropical zodiac perspective, whereas I use sidereal zodiac. Uh, and also, I have added my touches to a lot of some of the things that he also says about Jupiter with regards to uh, marriage and what Jupiter means in a woman's chart. And um, without further beating around the bush, basically this is about the dignity of Jupiter in a woman's chart and not just in her natal chart, but also in the D7 or the seventh harmonic slash divisional chart and the D9 chart, the ninth divisional chart, also called Navamsha in Vedic astrology. Um, I have, once again, I have made a, a video and I always post it uh, in every video description because I made a video about how you can get like your free divisional charts. So if you want to calculate your D7 or your Saptamsha, because that's what it's called, Saptamsha, uh, in Vedic astrology, you can pretty much you can follow the instructions that I left in that video about how to calculate your your D9 or Navamsha, and the only difference is that when you calculate it, you write seven instead of nine. Uh, you'll see when you get to the video because like at some point it asks you to you know select a nine at some point. Um, so yeah, in case you want to get a free chart, but otherwise I'm pretty sure that there are some websites where you can just calculate them, like you can just Google free chart cal calculator and look for Subtom Show or D7 chart. Um, so small parenthesis. So what is Jupiter in the D1 chart? The D1 or the natal chart, which is the chart that everybody first calculates when they are 
getting into their astrological journey. So the D1 chart is basically your life's journey and your path in this life. So it rules obviously a lot of things. You can see a lot of things from the D1 chart. Most of the interpretations that I make are from the D1 chart. Um, and uh, it rules, so Jupiter in the D1 influences pretty much every area of life, but more specifically, it influences your path in life and it influences your career. And having a strong Jupiter in the D1 chart basically means that your partners, your long-term partners, the ones that you are attracting and are attracted to will be the kind of men who support you in your life path and subsequently will improve your entire life by being in a relationship with you. If, on the other hand, you have a bad Jupiter in the D1 chart, um, you're going to have a, basically a sloppy husband archetype. And um, like um, Ernst Wilhelm also says, there are basically three levels of Jupiter. Either it's, quote, um, awake, meaning basically dignified um, in, in a good position, and Jupiter is awake in the signs of Pisces, Sagittarius, and Cancer, Cancer being his sign of exaltation. And uh, can and uh, Pisces and Sagittarius are, of course, the signs that Jupiter naturally rules. So Jupiter is strong in these signs because he is in his own element. And then there are also various aspects, and I'm going to give you a point system at at the end after I go through the whole general theory. Um, a point system by which you can calculate the strength of your Jupiter in the natal chart and in the other two charts, D7 and D9. And so, basically, if you have a strong Jupiter in the D1 chart, you will have, uh, yeah, like I said, somebody who will support you. And if you have a bad Jupiter, basically you have a bad husband archetype. And you'll see when I get to the examples, like, basically, women who have a strong Jupiter, from what I've noticed and what I've noticed in the readings that I've done as well, um, they really get a lot of help in life from their romantic partners. And notice that I say romantic partners, not necessarily husband, because as I mentioned in previous videos, uh, especially the one with regards to delay in marriage, um, not every woman is meant to get married, or like, not every, mo not every woman is going to be happily married. So it's actually indicated for some women uh, because in this video, I am specifically talking about women. Um, for some women, it is indicated that they don't uh, formally tie the knot and they just stay in long-term relationships. So Jupiter basically signifies long-term relationships, not necessarily literally somebody that you sign the marriage contract with. And yeah, as I was saying, the women who have a strong Jupiter have partners who really assist them in life and a lot of the times their partners play a crucial role in this woman's personal and professional success and fulfillment but it's not necessary so in the d1 chart it is not not absolutely necessary that you will have a good jupiter um, because the D1, again, signifies your life's path. So te technically speaking, obviously it's good to have a good Jupiter because that means that your partner is going to be of help to you and is going to be attentive to your needs and, you know, all that and supportive. But uh, when it comes to your life's purpose, you don't absolutely need a good partner to be successful. Um, <laughs> you can do it by yourself, technically speaking. However, in the D7 chart, which or the Septamsha, it's actually the most crucial that you have a good position, a well-positioned Jupiter, because the D7 rules partnerships, um, intimacy, so sexuality, and children. So basically, it's it's also called kind of like the chart of of. Um, 
partnership creation or of co-creation. Everything that comes from um, a partnership, including business, actually, is ruled by the D7 chart. And the D7 is also the chart that you look for to, you know, get indications about a person's future children or present children or, you know, things like what gender is your first child going to be? Um, you know, how many children will you have children? Are the children going to be good for you? Or are they going to be, you know, depressing and all that stuff? Um, so the D7, <laughs> in the D7, Jupiter basically shows, um, in short, and again, this is something that I've noticed in charts that I've read also for the people that I have known for a long time, um, a bad Jupiter in the D7 uh, basically means a bad father figure for your children, um, among other things. Obviously, there will be variations, but um, you need to understand that the D7 is everything that... Uh, so, in the D7, Jupiter signifies everything that a husband or a long-term partner should be doing in order for the partnership to work, in order for children to be well taken care of and all that stuff. So if you have a bad Jupiter in the D7, um, you're going to have a husband who or a partner who is not going to be of much use to you. Um, you know, like those men who um, maybe they contribute with a check, but they don't they don't really take too much interest in their children. Maybe they are not really active father figures in their children's lives. Um, you know what I'm saying. So they're basically just not the greatest father figures. That's ultimately what it boils down to. Um, so it's kind of like the saddest situation if Jupiter is bad in the D7. Because, uh, and also again, D7 ruling intimacy and ruling partnerships and, and co-creation and love and all that stuff. Um, you could have, for instance, a, a bad Jupiter in the D7 could show a partner who doesn't want children when you do, for example. Or um, is not going to be fully invested, is not going to be responsive to your needs with regards to intimacy, etc., etc., um, so yeah, everything to do with marriage and partnership, basically. In the D9, or the Navamsha, which I have mentioned pre previously in other videos several times, um, D9 is basically seen as just as important as the natal chart or the D1 in Vedic astrology, because the D9 is the ninth harmonic, so it's kind of like an assessment, a microscopic view of your ninth house, so it rules your spiritual path. And even though the D9 technically influences you throughout your life because it shows, like, your soul and your spiritual path um, at its core and all this stuff, so it's an underlying current in your life, it only becomes fully active after the age of 35 or um, after marriage. And... Yeah, so the D9 shows your spiritual path. So, and, and here with this, the spiritual path thing, there are variations because some people, and, and again, I have mentioned this, uh, I think also in the delay in marriage video, that, for instance, there are people uh, who aren't meant to get married. You know, there's there are people who choose to focus their lives on finding God and having a relationship with God and devoting themselves to a spiritual path. Um, or there are people who are truly devoted to the idea of marriage and having a family and children and all this stuff. So, whichever the case may be, you know, whichever the spiritual path, a strong Jupiter in the Navamsha means that your husband or, like, your romantic partners are really going to support you in your spiritual journey. And... They're really going to uh, be there for you. You know, they're going to... Basically, they're going to support your path. You know what I'm saying? Like, for instance, if you love astrology, let's say, or you love esoteric knowledge, and you have a bad Jupiter in the Nabobsha, you're probably going to get partners who just make fun of you for having these interests. <laughs> like, or they're... At best, they're just going to totally ignore them as the weird idiosyncrasies 
that they don't get about you, but they're not going to be fully accepting and supportive. Somebody who has, like, a woman who has a strong Jupiter in the Navamsha, for instance, they're going to have somebody like, oh, like, oh, you want to go to an ashram for, like, six months next year? I think you should do that. Great. If you really want to do that, of course I'm talking about back when the world was normal, but, <laughs> like, hopefully it will be back there. Um... So yeah, so like a husband, you know, a strong Jupiter, that's what it's going to show. It's going to show a partner who is really fully supportive and fully empathetic and sensitive to your spiritual needs um, and your path in life and will believe in you. That's, that's a key word, again, because Jupiter is also about faith. Um... Right, so this was about the general general description for what Jupiter means in each chart. So basically, it's it's really important that Jupiter is in a decent uh, position in the D7. Um, <clears throat> but it's also good for each of those, you know, it's good if in the Navamsha. And also another thing that I can say is that, um, technically speaking, one theory is that, for instance, if you have a good Jupiter in the D7, and maybe you have a good Jupiter in the D1 as well, but Jupiter in the D9 is bad. Uh, let's say it's really bad, like it's debilitated, it's, you know, whatever. Um, <clears throat> what this basically means is that uh, you might be in that kind of, kind of scenario where um, you get married and then the relationship goes bad. Because remember, the D9 is also the chart of marriage, technically speaking, or life after marriage, you know. Uh, and another uh, description for Jupiter in the D9 being bad is that you could have partners who just don't never, never, you know, ask you to marry them. You know, like you're just, you know... <laughs> You know, you're 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 tapping your foot on the ground and like, okay, when is this gonna happen? We've been together for a hundred years, um, but if you have like a really trash Jupiter, because the the truth is that you know a bad Jupiter is just non-responsive. That's what it means. So it basically means that your partner or your husband is not really attentive to you the way that he should be. So he's not really sensitive to your needs, whereas a Jupiter that is really strong is going to be very attentive to your needs. You know, he's always going to be thinking, uh, okay, like, you know, a, a very attentive husband, you know, is going to be the kind that will wait for you with dinner on the table, like, at the end of the week or something. They're going to be like, oh, she worked really hard today, she's going to be tired, I'm going to fix her a bubble bath, or, like, something like that. That's a really awake Jupiter, you know, a, a husband or a partner that is just going to anticipate your needs and is going to meet you, you know, there. <laughs> like, they're not going to be, you're not going to need to tell them what to do, you know, they're going to know how to do the right thing in the relationship. Um, whereas, you know, if you have a bad Jupiter, again, you're going to have somebody who's like, you know, maybe you are bored and you haven't done anything romantic in six months and he's there, you know, watching football and drinking a beer <laughs> and, and not caring about your feelings. Um, and even maybe even after you throw a few hints, like, hey, do you think maybe we should be doing something more exciting? Uh, they're still going to be like, you know, not not responsive. And then there is a middle ground where Jupiter is not very well positioned, but not completely dead or asleep either. Uh, in which case, it's kind of like in between in the neutral signs. And in the in between, he is not fully, not fully responsive, but not fully unresponsive. Meaning... This is a Jupiter that is going to respond to you if you basically, uh, you know, pull his sleeve. You know, if you throw hints and you're like, hey, the trash is not going to take itself outside. They're going <laughs> to they're gonna get off the couch and do it. <laughs> like, <laughs> that kind of thing. So, to get into the precise positions... And this is kind of like, this is a point system, right? Um, 
So for the point system, I'm going to give you how many points each position uh, brings you. And basically, if the point system overall is above zero, it basically means better than average husband. And if the point system will sum up to less than zero, it's going to be a less than average good husband. Um, so, as I mentioned, or as I started talking about beforehand, so if Jupiter is in a good position, the best positions for Jupiter to be in are Pisces, Sagittarius, and Cancer. And if it is in one of these three signs, give yourself six points. And especially um, in the D7, you know, this is the... And when it comes to the point system, I would say calculate them separately. Well, um, you can calculate them overall for each for all of the three charts combined. So you can add up all your points and see the overall score. But it's also more specifically important to calculate your score per chart. So see your position, see your Jupiter's situation in the D1, and then in the D7, and then in the D9, because each of those will affect you in different ways, as I have mentioned previously. Right, so if Jupiter is one of these three best signs, uh, or it is in a good position, or uh, awake, so to speak, fully awake, uh, give yourself six points. If it is in, in one of the neutral signs, meaning Aries, Leo, Aquarius, or Scorpio, give yourself three points. This is where he is, quote, sleepy, uh, meaning he is not fully awake, but he is not comatose either. So responsive if you throw hints. Um, if it is in a bad position uh, or sleeping, quote unquote, um, it will be in Capricorn, which is its sign of debilitation, or the signs of Jupiter's natural enemies, Venus and Mercury, meaning the signs of Taurus, Libra, which are ruled by Venus, or the signs of Mercury, Gemini, and Virgo. So, five signs, it is in a bad position. Capricorn, Taurus, Libra, Gemini, and Virgo. Uh, if it is in any of these signs, six, minus six points. So, give it minus six points. Um, and then, you want to look at aspects. But aspects are only to be looked at for the D1 chart. So at the divisional charts, at the D7 and the D9 aspects don't really make any difference um, because they mean different things and they're interpreted differently. So aspects in the D1. If Jupiter is with friends, uh, Jupiter's planetary friends are Mars and Moon. So if Jupiter is conjunct Mars or conjunct Moon, give it six points for each of those. So if Jupiter is conjunct both Mars and Moon, that's 12 points. That's really good. For instance, Angelina Jolie has a very strong Jupiter in her D1 uh, because her Jupiter is conjunct Moon and Mars and it's also in Pisces. But I will get into that um, in a bit when I reach the examples. Then if Jupiter, if Moon and Mars aspects Jupiter, so remember what I said uh, in previous videos. Uh, Mars, uh, so aspects means any other of the aspects that are not the conjunction. And in Vedic astrology, Mars aspects the fourth, the seventh, or the eighth sign from itself. So for any of these aspects of Mars to Jupiter, give yourself three points. And then for the moon, it's just the opposition because the moon can only do can only have the conjunction or the opposition as aspect. So if the moon is opposite Jupiter, give it three points. Then if Sun is conjunct Jupiter, this is kind of weird because like Jupiter, technically speaking, uh, sorry, the Sun, technically speaking, is actually a friend of Jupiter, but the Sun in Vedic Astrology is seen as a malefic, because in order to understand this, 
this is gonna be a bit of a long parenthesis. Uh, remember the myth of, like, Icarus and Dedalus? I don't know how to pronounce it properly in English. But you know that myth of, you know, um... I think he was some character in mythology that, uh, wanted to touch the sun and despite what he was told that nobody could reach the sun and he created these wings that were tied together by wax and the closer he got to the sun um, the wax was melting and eventually his wings fell off and he died um, I know it's kind of like a sad tragic <laughs> myth story whatever legend um, and yeah so this is kind of important because you see the sun is so bright that it blinds people and it burns everything. It, it it's it's called a malefic in astrology because it burns the signification the signific yeah, the significators of the house and the planets that it touches in the natal chart. Um because the sun is basically your spiritual path, you know, it's it's your ultimate among other things, it shows your ultimate goal in this life. It's one of the significators of your goal. Uh, it's your soul's purpose in this reincarnation. So, basically what it means uh, for you to have Sun conjunct Jupiter is it's not necessarily that the husband is going to be bad, but it's actually going to be more like you're going to see the husband as something that has to be um, overlooked or sacrificed, quote-unquote, in order for you to reach your uh, spiritual goals or to be true to your spiritual path. So you could have a really good husband, but at some point you're going to feel like you need to let them go in order to pursue your path in this life. Um, so if you have Sun conjunct Jupiter, give yourself minus six points because of that, even though technically speaking... Yeah, Sun is not the enemy of Jupiter. Um, and also, give yourself minus three points if Sun is opposite Jupiter. Um, also, let me see. Mercury and Venus. Since Mercury and Venus are the enemy planets of the Sun... Um, you, if, if Mercury or Venus are conjunct Jupiter, give yourself minus six points for each. Um, because here, see, what happens with Mercury is, Mercury is, remember, the natural ruler of Gemini and Virgo. So, it represents, um, um, kind of dispersion. You know, Jupiter is uh, basically long-term goals and stuff like that, so it's like overview, the overview of an entire plan or something, or long-term plans, uh, purpose, sense of purpose, that kind of thing. Whereas Mercury, think of how Gemini, for instance, was often described the social butterfly of the Zodiac. Um, so Mercury really is kind of a scatterbrain sort of energy. Uh, not to offend anybody who has a lot of Mercury energy. Um, but basically what it means is if you have Jupiter conjunct Mercury, and also if you have, you know, Jupiter in Gemini or Virgo to some extent, um, it shows that your partner is going to be easily distracted by other things, and they're not going to be decisive enough to commit to you. Um... <laughs> You know, they're they're either going to be pursuing too many things at the same time, they're not going to be able to get their, you know, you know, together. And um, either it can translate into somebody who, uh, you know, kind of like that, the grasshopper who sang all summer, you know, that uh, is just too immature to Peter Pan to... Uh, be pinned down and focus on having a long-term serious relationship and having children, which is something that most women want from a man eventually in a long-term relationship. Uh, that's why Jupiter signifies the long-term partner, because if a Jupiter is strong, uh, the man will give you this naturally. Um, so yeah, that's what it means. It's basically Mercury conjunct Jupiter means that your partner is going to be pretty scattered in his energies and difficult to pin down, 
and might seem unreliable. Um, if Venus is conjunct Jupiter, you're going to have... This is kind of like the classic example, actually, of a philanderer. Now, not always, but this is kind of the one of the negative interpretations is that, you know, a man with Venus conjunct Jupiter will be very easily swayed by Venus things. And remember that Venus rules hedonism, pleasure, beauty, sensuality, all that stuff, and, you know, sugar spice, everything nice, the candy, you know, Jupiter conjunct Venus is going to be like a kid in the candy store, you know, when he's around good-looking women, and it's going to be pretty difficult for him to deny himself the fun of extramarital affairs. And of course, none of this is set in stone. It all depends on the overall overall chart of a person and how other planets play in this mix and all that stuff, right? But this is the overall general description for this plate for this aspect of Venus conjunct Jupiter. And uh, once again, if uh, Mercury Venus are opposite Jupiter, so not conjunct but opposite give yourself minus three points. It's still an influence, but a lesser influence. And let me think. Because I had I have notes here. Um, right. So apparently, especially if you have, like, and actually apparently this is true for both women and men, um, people who have Venus conjunct Jupiter, especially in the second, seventh, or tenth house, can be prone to be promiscuous. Obviously, depending on other placements in the chart. Now, Saturn aspecting Jupiter. Because, technically speaking, Saturn imposes some kind of pain, punishment, or restriction on anything that it touches. So, Saturn conjunct Jupiter, even though Jupiter is the great benefic and all that, uh, and uh, just another parenthesis, because you know that there is a Saturn-Jupiter conjunction going on, uh, on and off for like the next, I'm not sure how long, but definitely the next year. <sighs> and I have been considering doing a transit video, but I'm not really 100% sure. In case you're listening, let me know if you would be curious to hear a transit video for various ascendants. Um, yeah, because uh, Saturn conjunct Jupiter is a, a hurting aspect. It's, a, it's hurting Jupiter. And it's, it means that it's, it's going to weaken all of the significators of Jupiter in a, in, a, in, in a husband. So remember, these aspects are happening in your chart, not the, not the partner's chart. But if you have Saturn conjunct Jupiter, uh, you're going to be attracted to or you're going to attract men who have a weakened sense of their own Jupiter. So they're going to have a lack of purpose, a lack of vision. Um, they're going to maybe feel, maybe, sometimes actually this can also show depression. Um, but it can show a person who is not really clear and determined about their path in life. So if this person is not, you know, very clear about their own path, uh, they're unlikely to be very clear about you as well, or his attitude on relationships in general. Meaning, basically, the, sh the gist of it is uh, they're not going to be really, you know, all in that. They're not going to be ready to commit, uh, basically, you know. And, yeah... So, this was it, right, pretty much. This was the point system overall. Now, there might be other influences, but this is this is the general guideline, and I think it's enough to get a general idea. Obviously, there are nuances, and there are minor aspects and all that stuff, but they're not as important as the general, this general guideline. Um, you're going to get a pretty good sense if you just follow this point system that I, that I gave and in figuring out the strength of your Jupiter in each of those three charts that I mentioned. 
And now I'm going to mention some examples. And also, before I get into examples, remember, uh, so anything that is above zero technically shows an above average ha husband. Anything that is below zero shows a below average husband. Um, but also, you have to look at each divisional chart to see the position of Jupiter and how, in order to see how it will play out in each area of your life. Um, so, examples. The examples that I have looked at, I have only looked at the natal chart because it would have taken too long for me to uh, calculate. I have tried to look for online charts, but of course I didn't find any. Like, I'm talking about finding celebrities, divisional charts. No, I didn't find any. So, I only looked at the D1 chart because I already think it's it's telling enough just to look at celebrities' D1 charts. You can clearly see which of these women um, were actually helped by their partners in their lives and which of them had to do everything themselves, basically. Um, <laughs> and so basically, if Jupiter is really bad, um, the woman will have no support from her partners, from her partner figures. And actually, I would stretch it to no support from men in general, as far as I have noticed. And of course, you could also... I won't get into this, but I think that, you know, it's also probably because, uh, what do you call it? What What is it called? Like, when somebody plays out their beliefs. Um, they become self-fulfilling prophecies. Uh, this is an entire philosophical debate, but I think to some extent, you know, we all become self-fulfilling prophecies to some extent based on our charts um, because, well, not just based on our charts, obviously, because our charts are not the only things that define us, but when looking at an astrological chart, you can definitely see every person's perception on various subjects. But, yeah, I won't get into it. But basically, yeah, if you look at some of these famous women's charts, you will see that those of them who had strong Jupiters or relatively decent Jupiters had a lot of help from the male figures in their lives. And, and I'm going to start with Marilyn Monroe, who had Jupiter in Aquarius conjunct Mars. So Jupiter in Aquarius gives her three points, because Aquarius is one of the neutral signs. So it's not, it's not super awake, but it's not super unresponsive either. And then being conjunct Mars, Jupiter's friend, uh, gets her another three, another six points, sorry. So, in her natal chart, Jupiter has nine points, which is well above average. And if you think about Marilyn Monroe's life, I mean, uh, so much of her career was based on having affairs with producers and directors and whatever. And, and let's not forget, you know, the high-profile affairs that she had with political men. Um, all of which basically boosted her life, her reputation, her um, fame as an actress. So ultimately did help her in her path. And especially early on in her career, um, you know, she had partners that really helped her get jobs and all this stuff. And even her first husband, who, whom she married when she was only 16, um, was actually very understanding. Because he could have been, especially in those generations, you know, could have been a very narrow-minded a-hole who, you know, upon hearing that she wanted to divorce him to pursue a career as an actress, he could have thrown a tantrum and have her killed or something if he was truly a bad husband, right? But he was very understanding and just peacefully agreed to divorce her, um, you know, because she wanted to be an actress and she wanted to move to Hollywood. Um, so yeah, I think it definitely plays out. And another example, like I mentioned, Angelina Jolie, who has Jupiter conjunct Mars conjunct Moon in Pisces. This is a super strong Jupiter. So Jupiter in Pisces gives her six points, conjunct Mars, six points, conjunct Moon, six points. So yeah, that's 18 in total. That's massively strong. And again, in her life. I mean, she has had partners, I mean, as far as the media knows, including Brad Pitt, actually, um, you know, who were very supportive. I mean, <laughs> you know, all of her partners were basically, um, basically 
accommodating, you know, and probably very attentive to her needs and definitely not the kind of partners who would uh, be jealous, for instance, of her success or put her down or any, as, at least as far as was shown in the media again. And uh, also she had a few relationships like the one that she had with Bob Thornton that were quite high profile and ultimately her being an actress, um, you know, her career benefited from the publicity. So in a sense, it can be said that, you know, the partners did help her in her career. Um, <laughs> in achieving her path, you know, the D1 is not just the career, it's everything in your life, so basically it's your life's path, you know, um, yeah. So, let me see. Another example, um, Marie Curie, right, Marie Curie, again, is a really good example of somebody who had a good husband, because, again, she was born in a generation where, you know, most women were expected to be housewives, so, and especially in her time, having a good supportive husband was probably crucial in her being able to carry out her uh, path in life. Because, if I remember correctly, her husband was basically a, a colleague of hers or something like that. So he was definitely very supportive of her passion for, I think it was chemistry, right? Um, chemistry. And she also had, I think, two or three children. So, again, back in her day, if she didn't have a supportive husband, it would have been, it would have been very unlikely that she would have actually uh, been able to have not just a world-class career, but also a family um, and in her chart, she has Jupiter in Aquarius, conjunct Moon. So she has nine points, just like Marilyn Monroe. And also, it's really interesting here because, um, see, she has Jupiter conjunct Moon. See, the Moon's influence on Jupiter makes, a, a, makes your partner or your husband sensitive to your needs and your emotions. So you're going to get a partner who is receptive, who is willing to be compromising and, um, you know, accommodating and all that stuff. So again, this would have been crucial for a, a woman of a pretty left brain career. Or is it right brain? Right brain? <laughs> you know, which, whichever one is the scientific path, um, the logical path. Whereas Marilyn Monroe had Jupiter conjunct Mars, which Mars, you know, so both of these planets will give you six points, but each of them give you a different influence. That is what I'm, where I'm heading at, what I'm getting at. Uh, so Mars conjunct Jupiter would have just made, you know, would have meant just very energetic, uh, competitive uh, sort of partner, you know, and, and Again, this is like really fitting in Marilyn Monroe's chart because if I remember correctly, her producer boyfriends were basically fighting on her behalf to get her jobs at the beginning of her career, or at least one or two of them. I, I don't, I don't remember because I have, I have read or I have seen some documentaries about her, but it was a long time ago. Uh, but pretty much, like it is fitting, you know. And Margaret Thatcher. Um, didn't have any major aspects to her Jupiter, but her Jupiter was well, very well positioned in Sagittarius. Uh, got six points. So again, in, in Margaret Thatcher, in Margaret Thatcher's case, again, a woman in her time, uh, with her level of ambition, if she didn't have a supportive husband, it would have probably been very difficult for her to achieve her goals, really. Um... So, yeah, I mean, it probably, she probably would have managed either way, but probably would have been a lot more difficult. So, it, it's fair to say in any case that the husband was helpful in her life path. Um, Virginia Woolf, again, another case of a woman who was definitely helped by her husband a lot. If I remember correctly... She had ongoing problems with depression. She had also had some history of an abusive childhood. 
and she ha she was overall i mean she eventually did kill herself as far as i remember um so she was troubled you know mentally but her husband was very supportive of her work and uh you know opened a publishing house for her and took care of her uh you know made sure that she followed the recommendations of her doctors and all that stuff and in her charts she had jupiter in aries conjunct moon and conjunct Saturn. <laughs> so, um, she gets three points. Uh, but see, even though, this is why you cannot go, <laughs> I mean, I gave you the point system, but this is why you cannot, you know, you can't treat astrology as if it were ar arithmetic or mathematics, because there is no perfect formula. You have to look at each individual case to really understand what was happening. And in her case, for instance, even though she she had three points, um, you can see how, you know, maybe for her case, being an introverted, actually not introverted, but being a writer, being an intellectual, and considering her entire life's traje trajectory, uh, her Jupiter situation is perfectly supportive of her path. Because, see, um, you know, conjunct Saturn maybe shows, okay, so Jupiter was weakened, so maybe her husband was not um, 100% hundred percent I don't know super determined and passionate about his path in life uh, but um, Jupiter in conjunct moon meant that he was very attentive to her needs and very much uh, remember that moon is also the archetype of the caregiver so it really fits you know the fact that he was almost basically mothering her you know taking care of her making sure that she was eating right uh, I don't know if you've seen the hours there was some of there was there was some depiction of their relationship there um but yeah he was you know he was basically taking care of her you know and that was what she needed she needed somebody to be a solid ground for her um yeah and then on top of that you know jupiter being in aries uh again it kind of shows a person who is going to be a bit of a, a of a pioneer in something especially to do with education because uh, or at least somebody who's very academically assertive. And I think her husband was a publisher, pretty sure. Um, and uh, they both moved in a lot of intellectual circles. So it fits. It really fits. Um, Greta Garbo, um, her Jupiter, let me see. Right, Greta Garbo, for instance, technically speaking, did not have a good Jupiter. Um, her Jupiter was in Taurus, so she gets minus six points, and aspected by Mars, three points. See, it's really funny here, because like, with Greta Garbo, just as in the Marilyn Monroe case, even though in her case, you know, the, the Jupiter overall shows an, a, a below average husband potential, which kind of makes sense because eventually Greta Garbo never married. Um, and so maybe she was frustrated and never found the suitable husband. Um, but uh, being aspected by Mars, so being aspected by Mars, again, like in the Marilyn Monroe case, her uh, boyfriend, her initial boyfriend, I think, I forgot his name. Oh yeah, Stiller, but I don't remember his first name. So it was something Stiller, who was actually the guy who first cast her in her first major film. Uh, and basically launched her career. Because, and and here, here's the kick of it, because he was enamored, enamored with her beauty. You know, he saw her potential, her artistic potential. And Jupiter is in Taurus, which is ruled by Venus, and it is the planet of arts and beauty. And um, he gave her her first major job and then helped her get to America, after which, basically, he got fired from the film that he was supposed to be making. And meanwhile, he went back to, I think, Sweden, right? They were from Sweden. And she stayed into America and, and her career started taking off. Um, and also you have this, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, Mars is aspecting Jupiter, just as in the Marilyn Monroe case, her, uh, her partner Stiller was fighting to, for her, was fighting to get her jobs and to launch her career. 
uh, early on in her life. So there is that, that helpfulness. Um, and then we have the list of ladies that mostly have it bad. Uh, J.K. Rowling, who has Jupiter and Taurus, again, and no major aspect. Now, I haven't looked for all the minor ones, but there is no major aspect. Um, so she gets minus six points. And now, if I remember correctly, J.K. Rowling divorced her husband and the father of her only child. Um because, you know, she was miserable, she didn't give too many details, but she pretty much, after the divorce, uh, reached rock bottom and was unemployed and living off benefits when she started getting the idea for Harry Potter and she started to write the book that would eventually lead to her fame. Um, and see, this is a case of a woman who has achieved everything through her own efforts. There was no man you know, fighting for her. She had to fight herself, and if I remember correctly, she was rejected from, like, hundreds of publishing houses until she finally managed to get uh, the first uh, Harry Potter published. So, yeah, but basically what I'm trying to say is that, you know, some women, even without the help of a man, still manage to make it big. Uh, another example, Tanya Harding, who had Jupiter and Libra. Again, no major aspect. Minus six points. So, there was no man involved in her major, her success, basically. She was basically molded and pushed by her mother. Maybe that shows in other places of her chart. But definitely not with regards to her partner archetype. Britney Spears, Jupiter and Libra, minus six points. Unfortunately, with Britney Spears, you can kind of see the fact that she hasn't had any help from the man in her life. If anything, uh, according to the media stories, it was more like the men in her life have tried to exploit her in order to gain either money or fame, which is quite unfortunate. Um, yeah, but in, including her first, first ma major boyfriend, Justin Timberlake, and then, you know, whatever, the, her husband, the one that she married eventually, I forgot his name. But, yeah, the bottom line is that the, she didn't really get too much help um, in her life path. Because she does not seem to be too happy, not even now. Um, Jennifer Lopez, Jupiter in Virgo. Again, a woman who has made it, even though, funny enough, you know, Jennifer Lopez actually went through quite a few boyfriends. And... Remember when I made the video about um, whether a person likes younger or older spouses? Well, Jupiter in a Mercury ruled sign is going to make you attracted to younger spouses. And in her case, it kind of fits. Because I think she's had like a number of boyfriends who were quite younger than she was. But in any case, it shows another case of a woman who has basically made it on her own without really getting any help from any of her partners. Um, Gloria Steinem, fa famous feminist icon, and again, Jupiter and Virgo, definitely made it on her own, right? Um, and made, made a, a big point out of it. Um, Jane Austen, again, who famously, I think, never married. Uh, and became, you know, a massively popular author who is still famous hundreds of years after her death, um, had Jupiter and Taurus opposite Mercury. So her Jupiter was really, really bad. So it might explain why she never got married. Although, technically speaking, so Jupiter in a bad sign doesn't necessarily mean that... Uh, you're never going to get married or anything. None of this is fatalistic. And in fact, um, there is a so-called remedy. That's what they call them in Vedic astrology. Remedies are basically things that you can do to improve your karma. Uh, and in this case, with regards to your husband or the partner that you are going to attract in your life. And the only remedy for Jupiter, for a bad Jupiter, and even for a good Jupiter, because just because you have, uh, you know, good good planetary placements doesn't mean that you are um, having a positive outlook on life because maybe your attitude may not be the greatest when it comes to relationships and life and all that. But the only remedy, remedy 
that works with Jupiter is basically that, and I know this is going to sound cliche, but you need to learn how to be happy with yourself. Because Jupiter is... Um, it signifies, you know, spirituality, spiritual growth, joy, uh, you know, joie de vivre, and that's what they call it, like joy of life, you know, enjoying the little things in life, uh, doing what you love, finding pleasure in the little things, doing things that give your life meaning, staying true to yourself, sense of justice, uh, being fair, you know, in general in life, standing up for what is right for you, or what what you believe in. All of these things, as long as they're positive things. I'm not trying to say that you should, uh, you know, join angry protests. Um, I'm talking about positive things, always. Jupiter is always about spreading tolerance and love and joy and faith and all that stuff into the world. But it, in, in case you have a trashed Jupiter, it's you need to cultivate all of these things within yourself, within your life. So in other words, if you have a really bad Jupiter, you need to work on enjoying yourself. Like, you need to do things that make you happy, that bring the the sense of awe and respect for divinity back into your life. And depending on your Jupiter, this could be through a, a million ways, you know. It could be, like for instance, if you have Jupiter in a Venus sign, um, maybe you can embrace Wicca, you know, and I probably mentioned this before, there seems to be a connection between Taurus and Wicca. Try not to conjure anything, though, that's not a good idea, but you can focus on, you know, like, Wicca has a lot of self-suggestion spells, a lot of, uh, um, or, or just, you know, enjoying the small things, like, small pleasures in life that has to do with Taurus, like, cooking yourself a nice meal out of, you know, ingredients from scratch, taking a nice bath, listening to beautiful music, um, all of these things. So, like, and also another thing, like, while I'm talking about Venus aspecting or of influencing Jupiter, um, the women who have this placement, the risk is always that they're going to attract men who only like them for their looks. So, if you have this placement, like, if you have Jupiter in Libra or Taurus, or conjunct Venus, or opposite Venus, make sure that you do not spend, like, when it comes to attracting partners, at least, like, if you're going out for a date, for example, or if you're, you know, trying to attract a partner, you should never do anything external, and this is generally true for all women, but especially for these women who have Venus on, on Jupiter, um, the risk is that you're going to attract men who only like you for your beauty, you know, especially if you're naturally good looking, do not try to blow that out of proportion. Like, I'm not trying to say, you know, go up for a date looking like a homeless person, but don't go over the top, you know, don't put like five weaves on your head and, and, you know, show up with <laughs> your boobs hanging out and all that stuff because that's really, really going to attract the wrong crowd. And again, this is generally true for all women, but especially for women who have Venus on Jupiter because the risk is highest for you to attract a shallow jerk. And so, whichever the case, you know, whichever the case, like if you have Jupiter in a Mercury sign, you know, you should read more, you should um, maybe play games because Mercury in Gemini is about youthfulness. Um, socialize, you know, do little things that bring back the joy in your life, whatever makes you happy. And technically speaking, as long as you focus on just being joyful and finding meaning in your own life, um, and again, regardless of Jupiter placement, just finding a connection with divinity or a spiritual path is going to strengthen your Jupiter energy, and in turn, it will attract a partner who is, for lack of a better word, worthy of you. So, a partner who will be willing and able to meet you, to meet your needs, basically. And, yeah, that's pretty much it. I think I've covered everything. This is going to be a really long video. So, thank you if you have, um, you know, listened until the end. 
Also, once again, if you are interested in a personal consultation, please email me at the email that I will write in the video description. And also, please like, subscribe, hit the notifications bell, and any feedback that you might, might want to leave, please write in the comments. And also, if you have any ideas of what other topics you might want to hear, please leave a comment, you know, below the video. And that was it. Hope you enjoy it and stay safe and thank you.